You can start, sir. Okay. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you all see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, great. Sir. Great, great. Okay. So we'll start off with the course. Today we'll be exploring React Native. Uh, today's session will mostly cover overview, fundamentals, and just getting a sense of how React Native works. And at the end of the session, we will also dive into some of the code examples and we'll uh, get hands on with changing certain codes and see how the application performs. And uh, in the uh, by the end of the course, we will set up the stage so that we can start working on a to do application. OK, this is like a intro of the course. And. Uh, so my name is Nagarjun. I am a software professional. I have about eight years of experience in software and I worked in uh, organizations like Twitter and Ticketmaster in uh, US. Also Samsung where, where I did an internship uh, based on hardware and software. Uh, so presently I am a founder of a startup called Big Bear Technologies where I work with uh, multiple uh, MSMEs in order to improve their operations and on in order to improve their ERP and CRM systems. So that's a brief about me. OK. So we'll start with what React Native is and how it was formed, why it was formed, right? So. React Native is actually an open source framework which was built by Facebook in early 2014-15 ish period. So basically what this framework does is it's a JavaScript uh, JavaScript based uh, framework which lets uh, developers build uh, applications for both Android and iOS using JavaScript. So this was very innovative at that time because there were a lot of web developers. JavaScript had just got popular uh, with a lot of web developers because of uh, beautiful animations and a lot of uh, uh, libraries, a lot of community uh, community packages that, that JavaScript had for web. Uh, JavaScript became really popular. And uh, during those days, the way mobile applications were built were using two mostly two popular languages that is Java and Objective C. If you want to build an Android application, there was an IDE called Eclipse, uh, and if you want to build iOS application, there was an IDE called Xcode, and Xcode still exists. Eclipse has uh, been pretty much has become outdated for uh, developing Android applications. Uh, in present day. A lot of uh, lot of us use Android Studio to build Android applications, and there are multiple other languages such as uh, uh, from Java, uh, Google developed Kotlin, which is again a multi-platform language. You can use Kotlin to uh, to build not just Android applications, but you can use Kotlin for building web apps. Uh, you can use Kotlin for building iOS app as well. Uh, and you can use Kotlin for building a uh, backend script as well, uh, as well as desktop applications. So Kotlin has become a multi-platform uh, language. Uh, similarly, Apple came up with another language called Swift, which became really popular, similar to Python. Uh, so these two languages are still uh, used for building native applications. And the reason why React Native became popular is it leveraged JavaScript, which was already familiar with a lot of people who are into web development, right? So in 2013, Facebook started building React Native application with their internal projects. And they realized that by doing that, uh, uh, they were uh, 
able to release builds faster they were uh, they were able to release new versions of application faster and they were uh, able to reduce the cost of the development overall cost of the development because one one single developer can build for both platforms so the cost thereby naturally reduces right so looking at all these improvements uh, facebook started facebook continued uh, building on React Native, and they released it for open source, uh, so that a lot of community uh, JavaScript developer community can adopt it and start building on top of it, right? And also, around 2018-ish, uh, Facebook uh, announced that they had completely rewritten the Instagram app using React Native. Then React Native became really popular amongst a lot of other companies because an app like Instagram could be built completely using React Native. So other the other companies also started uh, slowly started adopting. It. But in today's world, right? Uh, if you were to learn a new language to build mobile applications, uh, React Native might not be the best option unless you already know JavaScript and you want to uh, you don't want to learn another language. Uh, only then React Native would be uh, appropriate. Because eventually, as the complexity of the application grows, right, uh, React Native uh, applications tend to perform uh, slightly uh, had had slight had slightly performance issues compared to native applications. That is because uh, React Native int introduces uh, middle layers uh, in the application process. We will go through that. Or oh, why? why react native performance is not at par with native applications okay so okay let's see what is under the hood in react native right so uh, we i i am assuming that most of us know react js like so we are we are mostly familiar with building uh, web applications with react js right so react native also pretty much uses the same uh, same learnings of react js but under the hood there is some slight differences of how react native works actually major differences how how it works so in case of react js uh, there is a concept of dom and virtual dom but react native does not have that concept of virtual dom instead there is something called as a shadow tree uh, which is similar to virtual dom, virtual dom uh, where it manages all the view uh, layout of the view calculates the view measurements and stuff so that is done by uh, shadow tree which is very similar to what virtual dom in case of browsers okay so here you can see an example of uh, an app, a React Native app. So in this app, you can see that we are importing React Native. We are importing view from React Native and we are using that view in the component to return our uh, UI, right? So how this, uh, so we define the entire component in JavaScript, right? So what happens here is when, when we run this application, this JavaScript actually gets interpreted in a separate thread, which is running in the background on the user's mobile device. And that thread, in turn communicates with the uh, native thread, which is also known as the UI thread or the main thread. So every application, uh, when whenever you launch an application, when you click on any application in your uh, mobile phone, it starts, uh, it starts a process. In that process, there will be multiple threads. And one of the thread is the main thread or the UI thread, which handles all the UI specific rendering of that application okay so ui thread is an important part of both android and ios applications because a 
bulk of the uh, bulk of the user interface that you see all the touch actions that you perform on the application and all the rendering that happens everything is handled by ui thread so it is very important that we need to be careful when we are performing certain actions on ui thread like we should not be uh, making network calls on ui thread we should not be making uh, database calls on ui thread or not we should not in general we should not make any uh, any uh, computation uh, which is heavy and takes time so that uh, the thread is busy doing the computation and it cannot render the ui so it is necessary for ui thread to render at 60 frames per second so if at all an application is uh, the ui thread is not rendering at 60 frames per second that's when you see jank so when you are using an application you click a button but it takes some time to reflect uh, that's because the application is not running at 60 frames per second right so we need to be careful about how what code is running on ui thread and what we are doing on that thread so yeah so in react native what are the threads that are involved so these are the four threads that you can see which mostly react native users actually only three threads uh, so main thread which we discussed this main thread is also known as ui thread and this is actually launched by the uh, native application uh, it's not invoked by react native it uh, the native the os level uh, like the os level modules are the ones that launch the ui thread and javascript thread is the one that uh, react native uses and all the javascript calculations everything happens in this native bridge we will discuss what native bridge is this is a, a, a program which is running inside main thread and we'll see what it does okay and shadow thread so recently a uh, few years back react native introduced shadow thread which uh, mostly what the the purpose of shadow thread is to uh, ease the task of main thread so bulk of the work was being done by main thread in or, in order to render the ui uh, so that work gets divided between shadow thread and main thread so that the ui performance uh, the app is more responsive and the UI is smooth to interact with. So that is shadow thread. We'll go through each of these. So main thread, again, as I said, main thread is the is the uh, is the first thread that the application launches when when it is clicked on, and it this thread mostly runs the native code the platform specific code right so let us see what are some of the tasks that main thread does right whenever this thread is uh, launched it initializes the application it renders the ui manages all the user actions like touch events gestures and other user inputs and this thread invokes the Java th JavaScript thread. So the entire applic, we also have to remember that when we are working with any mobile application, there are certain lifecycle methods. We will come, come through those lifecycle methods and how we can hand work with those methods. So all the lifecycle methods run inside the main thread. So it is important that inside the lifecycle methods, we should not be make we should not be performing any heavy uh, heavy com computation okay so let's see what is happening in javascript thread so in javascript thread all the react code which which all the react code is usually javascript right we write all the business logic in javascript we define the ui in javascript and we add any uh, additional libraries which are also written in javascript right so this javascript thread it actually uh, bundles the entire uh, javascript 
into a single file. Usually most of the React applications have single file, single JavaScript bundle file. But you can also build React applications with multiple bundle files. Like uh, if there are few cases where you would want to do that. Suppose you don't want the initial mobile application to be bulky. Uh, suppose if you build the application and provide all the features, maybe it would consume like 200 MB and uh, the user will think twice in order to download it because their uh, device doesn't have that much uh, memory. We use a ton of mobile applications on a daily basis, so we are continuously running out of memory on our devices always. Uh, so whenever we want to download a new app, we usually look at how much memory is this app going to consume, right? So if at all you build an app which consumes like say 500 MB, uh, the user is not going to download it because it it is going to consume time and uh, memory. So instead, the other option is to build an app with limited set of features as a bundle and release that. And as and when the user wants to try out more features, you can create smaller bundles, smaller JavaScript bundles and dynamically uh, download that over a network and enable those features. So React Native has that option. Uh, so, but most of the times uh, the bundle file is going to be one single file. Okay, it uh, it is the JavaScript bundle file is uh, usually compressed and minified so that the space consumption is reduced. Okay, and this JavaScript thread is also responsible for detecting any changes in JavaScript, and it will uh, it will communicate that change to the native uh, thread. Okay, so the changes can be related to component st uh, state changes in react uh, the state of the component keeps changing based on the user uh, interaction right so those changes can be communicated uh, will be communicated by javascript thread to the native uh, ui thread or the native modules and layout changes also is communicated any click event or event handler changes is communicated from the javascript to the native and all the other js logic all the business logic right and every time this thread detects a change it packs a new bundle file and it passes that to the bridge through the bridge we will see what the bridge is so again as we saw in the previous slide, bridge is not a separate thread by itself. We will see what a bridge is. So React Native Bridge is a mechanism that facilitates communication between JavaScript thread and the native modules that are running on the UI thread or the main thread. Right? So this bridge is a program which is present within the main thread and it is used to communicate with the JavaScript thread. So the, the bridge actually receives the bundle file from the JavaScript thread, and based on that, it will communicate that to the native code. Okay, and it is not running on the separate thread. So what is what does that bridge do is it serializes the messages between JS thread and the native modules. So serialization is one of the important concepts in mobile applications uh, because every data that is being passed from one uh, screen to another screen or one or from JavaScript to the native is all this data have to be serialized. Serialized is nothing but converting the object into a storable format. In that is converting in memory object data to a format that can be stored or transmitted across the bridge. Okay. So all this communication happens asynchronously so that the UI is not disturbed. The, rent, the UI thread is not disturbed by this communication mechanism. Okay. So this is what native bridge does. 
and shadow thread so shadow thread as i mentioned it's a, a newer introduction in the react native architecture so this uh, before shadow thread the main thread used to handle all the layout changes it used to do with the calculations and then uh, it used to do the rendering so with the introduction of shadow thread the shadow thread takes up the calculations part so in react we use something called flexbox which is very similar to the flexbox in uh, uh, react js so this the flex uh, system of layout is different from what the native application uses so android and ios does not understand flex flex uh, layout system right they use their own layout mechanisms so that uh, flexbox layout uh, code needs to be converted in a way that it is understood by the native code so that work also is done by shadow thread so it calculates the dimensions it constructs a shadow tree which is similar to the dom tree and it uh, it also parses that flex code and converts it to a system that is understood by the native platform either ios or android so shadow thread uses a engine called yoga engine uh, react native has this uh, engine called yoga engine which converts that flex code to the native code okay so this is like a, a pictorial representation of how all these threads communicate so in javascript thread we have react native js javascript library and we have all the components and other business logic and then we have a bridge which is a part of main thread but it uh, it in, it is the it is the name as the name suggests it is the bridge between the javascript thread and the uh, main thread so shadow thread again runs in the background and it uses yoga engine in order to convert all the uh, layout code flexbox layout code into the native layout code and through the bridge all that information is communicated with the uh, native platform okay this is how react native works under the hood so now let us see what are some of the concepts when which we need to learn when we are working with react native so we know that what a component is in uh, in react applications right so it is nothing but building blocks for an application but android and ios have different uh, different uh, building blocks component does not uh, there is no such uh, thing as component in android and ios applications the naming conventions are also different so we need to before when we before we start building applications on react native we need to understand some of the naming conventions as well like what is uh, a component in android what is a component in ios what is a view in android what is a view in ios because when we want to debug any application having knowledge of uh, having a overview uh, understanding of the native platform will help us solve the problems easily okay so in android what happens uh, is whenever we are building a react native app the android in for android platform a single activity activity is nothing but a screen so when you launch an app in android the the screen that you see the first window or screen that you see is nothing but an activity and uh, for react native applications there is only one activity present throughout the application if you are building native application you might have uh, come across uh, uh, when you click on a button uh, the screen changes and 
in the when you when you click on when you click back or when you see history in the android app you will see there are multiple screens of that app right those are nothing but activities and uh, in react app there will always be only one activity for android and there is no concept of activity in ios ios by default uses a single uh, window and it keeps changing multiple views on top of that window so react also follows a similar approach it uses a single activity and it keeps changing views on top of that activity so activity is similar to ui view controller in ios so here we just uh, give a brief comparison of those so activity is nothing but an entry point for interacting with the user entry point for interacting with the application actually it represents a single screen with a user interface react application by default uses a single activity for the entire android uh, for entire application in android in ios it could use multiple ui view controllers we'll see what view controller is so now in order for our application to work smoothly we need to understand how this activity and ui controller life cycle is so we'll we'll just see the life cycle methods so every time an activity is created by the application when you first launch an application it first runs on create that means it is creating the layout for that for that particular uh, activity or the screen similarly in ios it will invoke view did load and then it runs on start and on resume so before it is displayed to the user it would have run on create on start and on resume in android and in ios it would have run view did load and view will appear okay so these are some of the methods that are run by life cycle uh, by the platform life cycle and these methods are useful to perform any initialization uh, or any fetching of data from the uh, network in order to display when the app starts and things like that similarly just before the app is exiting these three methods are run on pause on stop and on destroy for android and view will disappear view did unload and dialog for ios so again these methods are used to clean up for clean up purpose like uh, if at all you, you are uh, you have set up some some streaming connection uh, when the application just started running you would not want that connection to be open when the application is in the background right because the user is not looking at it uh, but the streaming keeping the streaming connection open is waste of resource so when you detect on pause you would stop the connection network connection and when you detect on resume you would again initiate the connection so that the data uh, the streaming data is uh, up to date right this is how uh, in android and ios the activity view life cycle is being handled so we will see how this is done in react application okay uh, so another important concept uh, to know before building react native apps are the permissions how how the native platforms native applications uh, handle permissions various permissions like you might require bluetooth permission you might require uh, gps permission and things like that for a mobile app right so for android there is a file called android manifest.xml file this is uh, this file is like uh, is like a package.json file in uh, react native or in a uh, node application so it describes all the essen essential information about the app such as the operating system the android version that it needs to support the lowest or the highest android versions that the app needs to support and 
any Google Play services, like you want to accept payments or you want to accept any Google services like uh, Google Maps or any location services, all these permissions will be, will have to be registered in this uh, manifest file. So again, initially uh, when Android and iOS were first released, uh, the permissions were hard coded in the manifest file. But now what you can do is you can uh, hard code the bare minimum permissions that an application requires. Uh, for example, if you are building an email application, you definitely require uh, internet network permission. Without network permission, uh, email application uh, is useless, right? So you can hard code the email application, but uh, other permissions such as uh, uh, reading SMSs is not a mandatory for email application. So if at all uh, you want that permission, then you can uh, you can request runtime permissions. So uh, both Android and iOS provides runtime permissions as well as uh, uh, build time permissions. Build time permissions are the ones that uh, the user should accept when the app is being downloaded. Runtime is the user can decide after installing the app whether they want to give the permission or not. So React Native supports both. Similar to manifest file in iOS, there is something called uh, plist files. So there could be multiple plist file or a single plist file. Similarly, in Android, there could be multiple manifest files or a single manifest file, depending on how your app is structured. So plist file again uh, has various use cases for iOS applications. Uh, some of them are it can be used to store data, like if you want to store certain uh, uh, certain keys, security keys, or certain uh, the name of the app you want to hard code it, or you want to store certain information, key value information. That this is plist is the file where you can do that, and also uh, the this file also uses XML in order to define all this, uh, all the permissions that uh, the app should have, and also the user preferences, and also any other custom data that can be stored at the build time. So yeah, manifest and plist files are. Uh, after we learn that, let us come to the component lifecycle in React Native. So we have learned about life cycles for Android activity and iOS view controller, which is nothing but the main, the screen that you see. And in React, component lifecycle is one of the most important things that we need to understand. So for React, right, uh, all the views are nothing but components. And the the app, as the application becomes more complex, we will have more and more components in our application. And when we have more components, it is necessary to understand how these components, uh, how what the life cycle of these components are, so that we can make sure of any optimizations that we can do for the application. Okay. So these are some of the important methods for component lifecycle. First is constructor and then component did mount, should component update, component did catch, and component will unmount. So some of the names are self-explanatory, but we will go through what these are. So every component has a constructor which may or may not be implemented. If it is implemented, uh, it will have the props object, which is passed by the parent parent component. This props is nothing but the initial data that is required in order to render that component and usually passed by the parent. Right? Constructor should not return anything. And constructor, it is important that we do not do any side effects within the constructor, like performing network fetching, performing data fetching from network or any database operations. All that should not be done in constructor. Okay. 
and oh my bad and component did mount so if if at all this method is defined react will invoke this method when the component gets attached to the screen that is mounted to the screen and this method is most commonly used for performing network operations before we show the component suppose you want to show uh, uh, you are building a stock market application and when you click on any of the index when any of the ticker say for example you click on apple and you want to see the graph of that apple like live graph of how that stock is performing then you want to fetch that data before this component is, becomes visible to the user right so this data fetching generally happens in component did mount method okay and if at all this method is implemented it becomes necessary to implement other life cycle methods also in order to avoid some bugs so what react has done is they have introduced certain hooks where we can take advantage of those hooks and we can get the same effect of uh, implementing the life cycle methods the react in turn uh, inside its implementation does does invoke these life cycle methods uh, efficiently so that we don't have to manually uh, define these okay so use effect is one of the hook which is a built in function in react and this use effect is popularly used in order to replicate the uh, replicate the component did mount uh, functionality so here in this code what is happening is we have use effect and we have a function which doesn't return anything and we define another function which uh, which is getting returned and it is just logging to the console right so initially when uh, when the application when the component just gets attached it runs this code once so it prints component mounted and it does network fetching so again we need to use async here because comp this is a life cycle method it gets invoked uh it, it gets in, invoked on the main thread we don't want that we don't want the network call to happen on main thread so we will use async await actually it doesn't invoke on main thread uh but async await is a ni nice way to uh nice way to uh, write asynchronous code in order to uh, avoid some callbacks so here hello okay so once we invoke fetch data it asynchronously uh, fetches the information from api and then it sets the result in a state variable we will see an example of how this is happening and the return function in use effect is usually invoked when the component is just getting unmounted so that's why we log here component unmounted right and the, it is important to notice that we have an empty array here this empty array indicates that this method uh, this method is not dependent on any uh, basically this empty error defines the dependencies of uh, use effect so whenever a uh, dependency changes this use effect gets invoked again since we want to mimic the uh, functionality of component did mount we have to pass an empty array okay and there is another method called com should component update this method is ideally not required to be implemented but only in cases or where we want to optimize the performance of react application we can implement this method so 
basically what this method does is it accepts props state and context and then it will return a boolean whenever that boolean a returned boolean is false this <coughs> the react uh, will skip the rendering of that component so by default if this method is not implemented react will return true all the time so it will render the component every time 60 frames per second it will always render that component okay and there are some important things we should remember when we are implementing this method one is if if at all uh, just simple props and state comparison is required then we could use pure component in react instead of implementing this method so what pure component does is it by default it implements its method and it compares the present state with the next state here in the input it compares the existing state and the next state it does a shallow comparison of that of the states and if at all that states are same it will return false so that it will skip the uh, render if at all that states are different, it will return true. So if you just want to do comparison of props and states, it is advised not to implement this method. Instead, use pure components in React. Okay. And also it is required to remember that it is important to remember that returning false in this method does not guarantee that the component is not re-rendered. It is just an indication to the React framework that don't render this component, but React framework will uh, decide whether it has to render or not. It might override, uh, it might override, and it might still render even though false is being returned. Okay, and it does not when when false is returned in this component in one component, it does not prevent the children components from being re-rendered instead of so if at all you are building an application using functional components then we can use use memo instead of pure component so another lifecycle method is component did catch this is an interesting method so what this method does is Whenever this method is defined, uh, any of the children components, if at all there is an error thrown during rendering, that error, uh, this this method gets executed with that error information. So this method is mostly used for logging purpose. Like if at all a child, uh, any of the children component uh, throws an error, you want to log that error you can implement a component did catch in the parent component and then you will get the error object and info which contains the stack trace so you can use these two variables to log for logging purpose for debugging the application and it so this when when this method is implemented it it is typically used along with the Another method which calls get derived state from error. So when these both are methods are implemented, that component becomes an error boundary. That means any chi child of that component throws an error. Uh, the, the, the component where these two methods are implemented, the error is caught and uh, the state of that component can be changed by get derived state from error method. So this will return the new state. Based on that, you can display some error message on the UI. OK. And lastly, component will unmount. So again, if this method is implemented, it will be invoked just before the component is removed from the screen. As the name suggests, will unmount is like it is being unmounted. So just before that, it invokes this method. And it is mostly used for canceling any pending tasks. 
<clears throat> if at all there is any network call that is happening and the user just cancels the application, you could cancel the network call in component will unmount and also any subscriptions, data subscriptions. So basically component will unmount is a uh, has the exact opposite logic of the component did mount. So whatever uh, initiations that have been done in component did mount uh, should be undone in component will unmount. And again, the recommended approach is to use use effect. Uh, like how we saw uh, previously in component did mount. So the return method within this use effect gets executed just before the component is unmounted. So if at all this network call is still being still happening, we can stop that network call here because the component is being unmounted and we no longer need to display that data. Right? So use effect can perform both the functionality that is component did mount and component will unmount. Okay, so these are some of the lifecycle uh, methods of React uh, React components. So far, any questions? We will go through uh, the environment setup. What is required to set up the uh, set up your device in order to build React Native applications? But before that, any questions? We'll just take two minutes. If anybody have any questions or any doubts. All good so far. OK. Let's go through uh, how we can quickly set up an environment for building React Native applications. So I'll share this link in the chat. OK. So in order to build uh, applications for Android and iOS, right? If at all you want, you want, you are considering building React Native application uh, for iOS, Mac device is required. You can't build iOS applications on uh, a Linux system or Windows systems. Whereas Android application can be built on any of the systems. So to build Android application, you need the following things. Uh, Node, JDK, Java Development Kit, which uh, comes with uh, JRE and JVM. And you need Android Studio and Android SDKs. And Android emulator is optional. If at all you want an emulator or you can use a real device as well. And on Mac, you will require Node, Xcode, for building iOS applications, you need Xcode, you need command line tools and iOS simulator and CocoaPots. So CocoaPots is nothing but uh, NPM for iOS applications. It's like a package manager. Uh, if you want to uh, use any iOS libraries, CocoaPots makes it much easier. So these are some things that are required. Also, there is another library called Expo. Uh, Expo is uh, built by the React Native community. 
it's actually a platform for quickly setting up an environment and trying out a uh, react app on your mobile device so we will go through how to do that can you see my screen or you can just see the window can anyone confirm uh, just the window just the window okay can anyone see the terminal or no uh, no okay so okay is the terminal visible now yeah okay so yes. It's visible, right? Give me one second. So, first, in order to create an expo project, we have to just run this command after installing Node. So, once we run this command, expo will create a, an application project and it will install all the necessary uh it will install all the necessary dependencies and so we'll see what expo actually does by default expo sets up a multi-screen application so we'll go through a sample application and see how to run it on the device and we'll also go through the file structure of expo application so by default expo hides all the android and ios specific parts of react native application so if you are building an expo app uh, uh, it is assumed that uh, you don't want to dig into android and ios specific parts so expo by default encapsulates that and this makes it easier for most of the web based uh, web developers who are, who wants to build apps right they don't want to dig into android and ios specific code so expo does that for you and it also provides a pre-build command so whenever you run uh, npx expo pre-build it creates android and ios directories based on the configuration that you have set up in expo and once that directory is created then you can generate separate builds for each of those platforms so if at all you are using a custom ci then uh, running expo pre-build and uh, passing the android code and ios code separately through different ci's uh, makes sense because for ios you definitely require a mac uh, to build ios application you de definitely require a mac platform right so if you want to uh, customize any of the platform specific code in expo there is something called config plugins uh, we'll not get into that for now but we'll just quickly see how uh, so i have already run this command npx create expo app so that is this so it has set up a project for me and when i run np uh, x expo start it starts the project so what this is doing is it is uh, executing the javascript bundler it is bundling the entire uh, react native javascript code and then it is making that code available on this particular uh, local host or this this particular url so what we can do is we can install an app called uh, expo go which is available on Play Store. So we ran this command npx expo start. So it generated the bundle file. And then that, so once we download the expo app through Play Store and scan it, scan this QR code, we can see the, uh, see that application. Let me just show quickly how this works. So, uh, 
second. So here what I have done is uh, I have already run the run the expo bundler and it is running in the background and here I'll do I'll mirror my phone. Reason it's taking some time in the rough. Huh. Okay, so you all can see my screen. So here I open the expo app and I click on scan QR and I shall scan this QR. Let me try again. I'll spawn the UR code. I think uh, okay. Now it should work. One second, I'll stop mirroring and recreate the mirroring. Yeah. So can you can you all see the app? So this this particular application is uh, so I have not done any setup on my device. So I have just installed a node and with the help of Expo, it just downloads the bundler JavaScript bundler and it displays the QR code. Once you scan the QR code uh, in your mobile app, by downloading the Expo app, it automatically uses the native libraries or present on the app and it displays this UI. So if you see, yeah, so by clicking on this, it will display the score. And if you click on Explore, so this is basically a tabbed, uh, tab navigation uh, that Explore Expo has set up by default. And it has all this uh, routing routing mechanism mechanism 
So Expo supports both Android, iOS, and also web. So we will see how Expo does that. React Native by default does not support web. It only supports Android and iOS, uh, but Expo supports web as well. And it has set up custom fonts. And it has set up some animations also. So if you shake the device, it will in invoke the developer settings. And once clicking on reload, you can see that it is reloading the JavaScript bundle, refetching the bundle from the URL and displaying. So there's also some animation that is being set up. So all this is automatically done by the create expo package. So now let us go through the code of this create expo. So before we go through the code, yeah. so we'll see what are the commands that we can run in Expo. So once you set up an Expo project, we can run these commands. So npx expo start is going to start the bundle, bundler and it will display that uh, QR code. So you can scan the scan the QR code using your uh, uh, app expo go app on uh, Android or iOS. It supports both. And then npm run Android will automatically start the Android emulator on your device. If at all it is uh, by default you have a configured emulator, it will start that. Or if you have attached a device, it will run the application in on the Android device. And npm run iOS will start the iOS simulator. And run web, npm run web will start the expo app on the web. So now let us see how this. Uh, so we have seen live on the android de device how the expo app can be quickly built quickly prototyped now we'll go through the code of expo So this is uh, this is the uh, code. So here we see that it is just set up like a uh, like a node node project, and there is an app folder. So the layout, the underscore layout file, this is the initial file that gets run in Expo. And it, so the Expo file names itself. Uh, Expo uses uh, something called Expo Router in order to. So here you can see uh, Expo Router in order to uh, do the navigation between files, and file name itself becomes the uh, becomes the name for the navigation. So you don't have to uh, like how we saw in React. We need to register uh, register the component. We need to use that component in React Navigator. Uh, we don't have to do that in in when we are using Expo. The file name itself becomes uh, the uh, name which we can use to navigate. Okay. And here you see that in the tabs. So initially uh, we have a stack. Stack is using the the first screen of the stack is using tabs. If at all you delete the tabs, then it would display the not found UI. In tabs, we again have a layout. 
file. So in, this is displaying two tabs. One is index and the other is explore. So in index, we have the welcome page. We have welcome message. And there is an animation called hello wave. So you see this is a separate component. And there are, there are some steps. So index and explore becomes two different parts of the tab, tab, tab component. So, so these are the basic components that have been pre-built in Expo project. Hello wave is, so if you look at, they are using a library called React Native animated in order to import the animated view using this emoji to display an animated hand. So, and constants, use color scheme is another hook in React Native. Basically this uh, particular in particular uh, method is used for typically for light mode and dark mode. So if you look at the app and layout, there is a theme provider and the theme provider uses color scheme, which is a hook that is imported. And whenever the dark mode button is clicked, then it displays dark theme. Otherwise, it, it displays the default thing. And again, package.json is similar to our regular React application. So now we'll go through some of the core components in React. So we we have seen the components. Uh, what are we know what what some of the components are like? We can create our own components, but in when it comes to Android and iOS, uh, the basic component or uh, component is nothing but a view. Any any uh, anything that is displayed in an application, whether it's Android or iOS, it is a part of a view, and view. It can be as simple as a line or it can be as complex as a map. And a view can can have other ch child views within it. So that that view becomes a complex view and it incorporates certain layout mechanism. So Android and iOS both offer view as a built in component. Here you see uh, in iOS it is called UI view in Android. It is called view group. So view group is, as the name indicates, it it is a group of views. Like uh, you can include a text view, you can include an image view within a view group. In iOS, a UI view is similar to a view group. And so Android and iOS both have certain uh, complex layout groups, view groups which comes with prefixed layout mechanisms. In this example, you can see that it, it, it is displaying all these names in a table format. So this uh, table also comes as a view. In Android, it is nothing but a recycler view. In iOS, you have UI table view. So similarly, in React, we have flat list. Uh, and yeah, so there are multiple such complex view components. We will compare some of these components. So in React, the view component is nothing but view group in Android, which is similar to UI view in iOS. In web, all the divs and text component in React is text view. In Android, 
UI text view in iOS. Similarly, image becomes image view and UI image view in iOS. So at the at the end, uh, the React in React Native, these components should be translated into uh, these or this depending on where the application is running. Scroll view becomes scroll view in Android, UI scroll view in iOS. Text input becomes edit text and UI text field. So these are some of the new con uh, new components which uh, may not be present in React JS because these components are built for React Native and it will get translated into the native components once it is once it is uh, compiled. OK. So we'll see what all simple React application contains. So here we import React library and then we import a text library text component from React Native. So all the components come from React Native, but all the basic uh, lifecycle methods and other uh, libraries come from React. So here we are returning a hello component. And in that it is nothing but a text which says hello world. So let us see how we can do some styling and flexbox. So React Native does not support CSS styles. Uh, in case of React JS, what we can do is we can add a CSS file and we can import that and use those class names in in our uh, in our components. But React Native does not support CSS. Instead, there is an alternative for that. Uh, we will see. So all the core components in React Native uh, accept a prop named style, and that takes a JavaScript ob object of styles style definition. So in React Native, the difference between React and React Native styling is React Native uses camel case styling, whereas React uses a, a regular standard CSS uh, naming convention. So here you can see background color in React Native. This is how it is defined, whereas in CSS you can define background hyphen color. So all the naming conventions becomes camel case in React Native. And React Native provides a built-in component called style sheet. Style sheet is, is nothing but uh, it is similar to CSS file, CSS style sheet. So this component you can use it to create certain set of styles and apply it to a component. And the width and height properties of React Native are integers and it does not have any units. We can't use PX or DP or any of that in React Native. Uh, so whatever that integer uh, we use, it is nothing but a density independent pixel. So uh, most of the times we use width and height only when the view, uh, the only when we know beforehand that what is the width and height of the view and it does not change irrespective uh, of uh, how the device, what the device is. In those cases, we hard code the width and height. In other cases where we don't know what the view size should be, they, then we would use a flex layout system, just like how we do in React. So this is an example of styling in React Native. So we need to import a component called style sheet, which is a part of React Native library, and we'll create certain styles by invoking stylesheet.create method. So it takes the JavaScript. It takes a JSON object. Which has the names. Of the classes and then the styles associated with that class. And we can use it like styles dot container and styles dot red big blue blue all this. So we can also apply multiple styles just like how it is done in react JS. So this is an example of styling in React Native. And Flexbox. So we know what Flexbox is in React, right? For most of us, I'm assuming most of us know, but quickly to breeze through, it is nothing but an algorithm which defines how different 
uh, views or components need to be aligned. So some of the most commonly used commands are flex direction, align items and justify content, right? Flex direction has these four uh, ways of defining. That is, you want to uh, position all the components in the row format or in the column format or in the reverse row or reverse column format. Align items is used to align the items along the cross axis. Uh, by cross axis, it means that if at all you have flex direction as row, then align items is used uh, to align along the other axis other than the uh, horizontal. Similarly, justify content is used to uh, position items along the main axis. So we'll come through state management. Before going through state management, we can quickly skim through an example of styling in React. One second. So if you uh, if you go through the the React documentation, it explains uh, what the flex and how the flex layout works. It has an expo snack which you can click on and quickly experiment how these different layout layouts work. So, I'm, so this is an example for flex direction. So column and row. If if at all flex direction is mentioned as column. So you can see this uh, in the in the container. When we click on column, it uses column. So if at all I change this to flex direction to row. Column. think if it uses this variables here instead of it overrides that so that's why this is not working but anyway so these are some of the examples of row row reverse column reverse and column and ltr rtl is nothing but left to right and right to left it becomes important when building mobile applications uh, because in countries like in Arab countries, the application should work in a different format. So uh, the, you need to respect the the device setting that the user has set. If at all the device setting is set to LTR, uh, then you use the default. If it is set to RTL, then that needs to be read from the uh, device setting and need to be displayed accordingly. So these are some of the layout now we'll go through state management and some concepts on networking so similar to react in react native we use libraries like uState. state uh, inbuilt functions like use state, use reducer and use context in order to manage the state of the component. Use state is mostly used within the component and it takes a value 
which becomes the default initial value of the state and it it returns uh, an array which contains the uh, state variable as well as an function in order that can be invoked to update that state and use reducer is used when there is a complex state to be managed and that state is usually represented like as a json object and you want to perform and different performing different actions need to update update different fields in that in that object that's when use reducer is mostly used and use context is used when the state needs to be passed uh, deeply uh, from the parent to a deep nested child that's when use context is mostly used and uh, like how we saw in the uh, in the uh, in the expo example use context was being used to uh, set whether the ui should be displayed in the dark mode or light mode it is a uh, use color scheme was being used which is similar to use context you can uh, replicate the same effect using use context as well so uh, when it comes to networking we all know that every mobile application needs to fetch some data from external sources and that data gets stored in the state and then displayed to the uh, on the ui right so all this mostly typically happens within use effect method in that component and react native has a built-in library to perform networking uh, that is xml http request api it also supports web sockets for any of the streaming data or presence indicator all these concepts can be built using web web sockets so web sockets provide full duplex communication channel uh, whereas tcp http is like it doesn't have a live socket as such it's only a pooling mechanism like whenever you perform a request you get a response and there is no concept of uh, cross origin in react native in mobile applications there's no concept of cross origin and we we should remember that when we are doing some networking on react native and for some reason it doesn't work uh, then it means that uh, it means that the underlying platform that is android or ios is probably blocking your network call so some of the things that we could look into is uh, the latest version of android and ios always uh, uses https urls suppose if your url is http then uh, that network call will not uh, fetch the data it will just uh, it will just return 400 so in that case it is required to register that http url in your android manifest as well as ios p list as an exception for to indicate your app to allow http urls and you can also use some uh, libraries, networking libraries uh, present in React, like Axios, uh, along in React Native as well. <clears throat> so another important concept in Rea uh, React applications is uh, async storage. So async storage is a library which is maintained by the React Native community, and it is mostly used to persist data across uh, across your application lifecycle like even after the application is closed and reopened if you want to persist certain data a uh, certain uh, you component state then that uh, data can be stored using async storage and uh, async storage is a key value based storage it is an not encrypted and every application uh, has async storage in its sandbox environment that means uh, the data that is stored in async storage in one application cannot be shared with another application so also these are some of the 
do's and don'ts when we are using async storage. Async storage is not encrypted, so we should not be store storing any of our secret keys or any of the tokens, uh, any of that sort of things in async storage. It can be used to store non-sensitive data across app runs, and it can be stored used to store Redux state. Redux is again a state management library. Uh, there are multiple state management libraries nowadays, and you can build a sophisticated application even without using Redux. So persisting GraphQL state uh, and storing any other global variables for the application that can be done in async storage. So, so this is pretty much the basics for the React native application. Any doubts, any questions, guys? Anybody working on React Native application presently? So in the next session, we will go through building a map to do application from, uh, from ground up. We will use Expo to do that so that we can modify the code and uh, see the application live. For today's class, that's all I had to cover. Anybody have any questions? No questions? Friends, if you have any questions, please ask Satakshi, Yamit, Vipin, Aryan. So for any of your projects, are you guys building mobile application using React Native? So it would be nice if uh, if uh, whoever is working on React Native, it would be nice if you can, uh, uh, for the next class, it would be nice if I can have uh, you explore Expo, if you're not already aware of Expo. Explore Expo platform and Build a simple single to do object without any actions on it, like just the UI part. Okay, that would be the task for the next session. Today's session, uh, if there are no questions, we can wrap up. Have you seen images posted on? Guys, any questions? No? I think we can wrap up the session for today and in the next session we will start working on the to-do application yeah okay,
so uh, thank you so much nagarjun sir uh, for your valuable insights of the session thank you guys uh, we'll see you in the next session and i'm sharing your feedback from like please feel free to provide your feedback so that our mentors and uh, our team can uh, definitely uh, it will help us to improve on those things thank you sir thank you guys thank you thank you everyone thank you sir.